Who would have thought it? Here we are back again. Hey guys, it's me, Greg, and welcome to the Just a Brit Abroad podcast. This is episode number two. I'm surprised we made it this far. Maybe you guys are too, but thank you if you've tuned in again this week for another episode. If you're new in town and you don't really know what's going on, this is the Just a Brit Abroad podcast. I'm a Brit. I'm living abroad. This show is the show where every two weeks we group together for people interested in similar topics, and we talk about all things lifestyle, culture, travel, over time I'm hoping to involve you guys as well in some of these episodes so if you're new in town make sure you subscribe so that you get notified every time a new episode comes out great to have you here and uh, yeah let's get stuck in shall we And today I'm gonna be doing a YouTube tag called the Living Abroad Tag. And this is a tag that comes from the Dream Days blog, a WordPress blog. Uh, We're gonna be taking 10 questions and you're gonna get to know a little bit more about me as a British person living abroad, my experiences, what I like and don't like. um, And I'd love to hear what you think as well. So make sure to chuck that in the comments below. So let's get stuck straight in. Question number one, what country do you live in? Well, thank you for asking. Uh, I live in Sweden. Question number two, how long have I lived here? Well, I've lived out here now for just over two years. I moved at the start of 2019. um, And yeah, so I've been out here since February 2019. It's now March 2021. Um, even though I guess the last year kind of doesn't really count because let's be honest, none of us have been or moved anywhere. So maybe I've lived here one year, maybe I've lived here two years. I'll let you be the decider. Question number three, have you ever lived in another country apart from your own and the one you're living in now? Depends where you draw the borders really, because I've never officially been a resident in another country apart from here in Sweden, but I did spend a summer living out in Cyprus, in the northern half of Cyprus, the Turkish side, uh, for a conservation project a couple of years ago. And I'm not gonna go too far into that now because I'm sure we can do a whole other episode uh, with a story time where we talk about uh, my experiences living in Cyprus. If you're interested in that, let me know down below. But basically, it was a turtle conservation project. Uh, I was a num- one of a number of volunteers who helped to look after the baby turtles as they were being born and make sure they got out into the sea and survived properly. I lived out there for about three months. So um, that's the closest I got to living abroad. But as I say, there was always an end period. I wasn't a resident, so maybe that doesn't really count. So I would say this is the first time I've properly lived abroad. Did you expect to end up living where you do? No, not really. When I was younger, I always used to say to my friends and family that I could see myself moving to Spain. I have loved Barcelona for years and years. I've been there probably four or five times now, and every time I love it even more. So I really thought that would be where I spent my days. Um, There is a reason for why I ended up here. I've alluded to it in my past episodes, um, but that story will come for a different time. But yeah, so I didn't expect to end up living in Sweden. So no, I didn't think I'd be living here, but I'm glad I am. I really like living in Sweden. It's a fun place to be. Why you decided to move abroad? Uh, Well, that's interesting because I just said I wasn't going to tell this story yet. So let me give you the simple version. As I say, I'd always told my friends and family that I wanted to live abroad when I was older. Um, As I say, didn't think it was going to be Sweden. But the reason that I ended up out here was because my girlfriend is Swedish. So we met in London um, and then I ended up moving back out here when she was moving out here to uh, spend more time closer together. So we didn't have to be long distance for too long. And then the next question is, was it hard to get a residency permit here? Define hard, I would say. It wasn't easy, that's for sure. (laughs) There's lots of requirements that you have to meet. Uh, It did, it was a little bit easier for me because at the time the UK was part of the EU, uh, which was one of the reasons why I moved at the point I did rather than leaving it a little bit longer uh, because then I didn't have to apply as a third party national. Yeah, it wasn't that straightforward. And I get the impression that this is not me bashing Sweden in any way. I think it's hard whichever country you want to move to because there's all these requirements you have to meet. The hardest part was actually in Sweden, they have this thing called a personal number, which is kind of associated with you. And it it kind of makes sure that you're able to move through society and get access to certain services and benefits and things. But to be able to have one, you have to live in Sweden. But obviously to live in Sweden, you clearly need somewhere to live. But to be able to get somewhere to live, you need to have this personal number. So it's kind of this whole catch 22 where, you know, I had to move here, live in an Airbnb for a bit just to be able to, to say that I had an address so that I could get a personal number. I couldn't live in a permanent address because I didn't have a personal number. 
So it wasn't easy, but um, once I'd met those requirements, it was just to go to the tax agency here. And then after that, it was fairly plain sailing for me because of being an EU member. So I was quite lucky in that respect. How is it to live there uh, where you do now as a foreigner? Well, um, Sweden is, yeah, Sweden is a really cool place to be. And I think it's one of those places that is seen as a bit mystical. Maybe you don't know a lot about it unless you've been or you have some sort of association to it. But as a foreigner, um, one of the stereotypes is that it can be quite um, overwhelming because when you arrive, um, Swedes are known stereotypically, and I'm not saying this is everybody, but this is the stereotype as being, you know, quite insular, quite introverted, and, and, and maybe it's quite hard to get through those barriers. And I, I, I would say some of that's true, but, but not, you know, all of it. I mean, the people out here are really nice. Uh, my experience has been once you get to know Swedes, they're, they're really welcoming and really nice people. Um, but, but I understand why people think maybe it's a little bit hard to, to come in as a foreigner. And that was definitely something that I would say that um, you notice when you first arrive. But I think, you, may, you know, maybe that wouldn't be unique to being here either. I think wherever you live, when you move to a new country, unless you're going to be living in, you know, the capital city, it can be quite difficult to meet people. There are ways around it. Uh, you just have to make the effort. Is, is my conclusion. Do you have any tips for someone moving to that country? Well, funny you should ask. Uh, yeah, I would say make sure that once you're here, you try and find as many opportunities as possible to meet new people. And I mean, you know, both Swedes, but also internationals too. So one of the things that I used was a website called meetup.com, where they do a lot of different, people can organize community meetups to meet up with their friends. That felt like quite a good way for me to meet other people that were in a similar position to me. I went to language cafes because I was learning the language. Um, one thing that Sweden is known for is that Swedes are super, super good at English. So as me coming from an English speaking country, the language itself wasn't necessarily a barrier people will speak to me and understand me but uh, you know it's always good to be able to show that you're learning the language and that you're interested in the language because that can be an instant way to kind of create that sense of belonging and community and uh, getting to know people it's an ultimate icebreaker so um, I started learning the language that helped me to meet other people that are also trying to do the same I went to these random meetups I found on Facebook of course, I'd encourage you to do that as safely as possible. Do it through organized groups rather than trying to do it yourself. But it was a great way to meet new people. And um, yeah, I, I think it was a good way for me in the first instance to meet um, people that would then become friends. And uh, today I feel like I have quite a nice network here established in Sweden. But as I say, it's all about the effort that you put in is the effort you get back, I think. So if you don't go out and put yourself out there, then, then maybe the results aren't going to be so good. And it is uncomfortable at times, but I think that would be the case wherever you go. That's my tips for someone moving to Sweden. Um, now, the next question is an interesting one. Describe in one word your experience in this country. I obviously can't give any more detail. I can only give you the one word. So the one word that I would use to describe my experience here in Sweden would be nature. And then the final question in the tag today is uh, name one country you've never lived in before that you think you would quite like to move to at some point. And I'm taking this to mean, you know, not literally, so I'm not thinking about logistics and where it would be possible for me to move or where I'm likely to move. It's just a country that I'd like to live in if I had the opportunity, if I could just click my finger and go there right now. And right now I'm feeling like, not just because of the pandemic, but also because of um, lifestyle and things that I value, I think New Zealand would be a cool place to be. But as I say, especially because of the pandemic now, it feels like it's one of the few places in the world where life is fairly normal and I'm very jealous. But also, you know, I, I, I know people that are living out there. You see clips of it online. The landscapes look beautiful. The nature looks amazing. And it just looks like a really cool uh, place to live where you're kind of so different from where we are here in Europe. But, but at the same time, some creature comforts uh, that are familiar. So... What about you? Where would you like to live that you've not lived before? Where's your dream location to move to? Let me know in the comments below. I've mentioned it before, and I'm sure I'll mention it again on this podcast, that as a Brit, there are, of course, a number of things that I would say that I miss living in Sweden that I can't always get access to here. And one of the main categories that I really can't avoid talking about is, of course, food. Um, I said in the last episode that I was born in the year of the pig and true to its name, there are a number of foods that I absolutely crave and can't always get a hold of here. So now I'm going to count down my top five for you. Uh, if you're from England, I'd love to hear if you agree or disagree down below. If you're from another country, I'd love to hear whether any of these figure in your top five or whether it's totally different things that you that you miss or crave when you're living abroad or moving abroad or even traveling abroad. Um, it'd be really nice to know. 
But so let's get started. So what are the top five English foods that I miss? We're gonna start with number five. I've actually got the food that I'm gonna talk about right here in front of me. So one thing that I never expected to miss when I moved abroad was Cadbury's cream eggs. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, these little guys are a popular Easter treat in the UK. Um, I think they're in Ireland as well. Uh, it's a chocolate egg. So obviously it looks like an egg in the first place, but it's a chocolate egg and it's filled with goo that is made to look like it's a normal egg, but obviously a chocolate variety. So you have like the yellow center and the, the egg white um, and the egg itself. And I tell you what, these these guys are just amazing. And I know I've given, I've brought them back when I've been to England in the past. Of course, it's not so easy to get to England right now because of the pandemic. Uh, but these are something that I always miss uh, now that I'm living in Sweden come Easter time. Fortunately, I have a great family who uh, put in the effort to send me some in the post. And these little guys took about four weeks to come because of Brexit and the pandemic and everything else. And this is the last one, which is why I'm, I'm treasuring it. Otherwise, I would probably give you a taste test right now on camera um, because just seeing it makes me hungry. And apparently I'm not the only one because uh, I heard that they're one of the biggest things that get exported from the UK every year to expats living abroad. So apparently we all miss and crave them. Number four, it's gonna sound weird at first, but bear with me. Indian food. Yeah, I know England isn't really necessarily known for its Indian food, but we do have a lot of Indian people and Pakistani people that live in the UK. And it's great because it's helped to really transform the culture of our food. And actually a few years ago, the chicken tikka masala, I think was actually labeled as the most popular English takeaway, even though of course it's not an English takeaway. Uh, but one thing that I noticed being out here in Sweden is that the kind of type or quality or standard of Indian food here is very different from that that you get in the UK. Um, and I think that's because our food in the UK has been much more heavily influenced by um, that kind of um, Asian culture. And I just really love the Indian food that we have in England. I don't know, you know, how it compares to the real thing. If you actually lived in India, I'm sure it'd be a lot better out there but I really miss the Indian food that we have in England. I think it's really good, it's really spicy. Here they tend to, uh, it tends to be a little bit more mild. They don't tend to like spice as much from my experience. And even when you ask for a medium curry, sometimes it comes out with almost like a flake of chili pepper in and then you wonder why uh, you can better taste the spice. Um, not to say that there hasn't been some really good experiences here as well, but Indian food in the UK, I love it. Number three, um, I've grouped together, this is a bit of a cheat, uh, I've called it the English breakfast foods, and I don't mean a cooked full English breakfast. I'm not a fan of that at all. Bacon isn't really my, my favorite thing, I'll eat it. Same as eggs, I can eat them in different forms, but I wouldn't necessarily crave one. But there's a few things that I do crave at breakfast time that it's harder to get out here, or sometimes impossible, unless you make them yourself, of course. One is a crumpet. I don't know if you know what a crumpet is, it's a small circular, a uh, flour-based uh, breakfast. It's quite savoury and it's got little holes in the top. Then there's a hot cross bun, which is again something that we have at Easter, a bit of a theme here, um, which is like a bread bun, a sweet bread bun with like a cross on the top, of course, uh, to represent the Christianity connection. Uh, but we have those toasted with butter on top. And the only way I've been able to have them here is if we make them ourselves. And the third thing is breakfast bagels. And I know that these are really popular in America too, for example, but here in Sweden, bagels just don't seem to be a big thing. You can't just walk into the supermarket and find them around every corner. And that was something that surprised me. I love a good toasted bagel. Chuck some salmon and cream cheese on top, it's to die for. But apparently here, they don't agree. Number two is a good old British Sunday roast. Not to say again, just like the breakfast food, some of these things you can make yourself but uh, the, the gravy that they have here is different to the gravy that we have in England, of course. And it's just not, not what I'm used to, it's not the same. I miss a proper British Sunday night where you have, you know, all of the family sit down, you have your Yorkshire puddings, you have your roast potatoes, you have your cooked meat, you have your gravy, even better come Christmas time. We have recreated it here, um, you know, with all the veg and stuff, I love that too. Uh, but that's one thing that I miss, having that tradition of maybe once a week or once every couple of months having that on a Sunday. So that's my number two, which leaves only my top English favourite food that I miss. And I'm sure for any other Brits out there watching this, you are bound to agree with me. One thing that I miss every single time, every single week almost, is uh, a proper English cream tea. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you really need to get on the hype because you've been missing out. But we're talking about a scone that has been cut in half and either side has got clotted cream and strawberry jam on top. And then maybe you have some strawberries around the side and stuff like that. In England, of course, we're famous for having it 
uh, alongside some finger sandwiches and tea. I'm actually not a tea drinker, which is where I fit in with Sweden quite well. I love my coffee, uh, but I love to have a scone complete with this, yeah, like clotted cream. It's really hard to kind of explain what clotted cream is. Um, and we tried to recreate it here because you really can't buy it in any of the shops. Um, but actually it's, it's, it's this like butter that has been whipped for, I think it's like 12 hours. And then you have to put it in the fridge for some time and in the oven for a ridiculous amount of hours. And then it comes out like, whipped beyond belief and uh it's, it's really hard to describe it's not cream cream is just not the same english people you will understand is just so good and um both me and my swedish girlfriend crave these every time we go to the uk it's the first thing we ask to do when my friends or family say oh where should we meet what should we do take me for a cream tea i miss it I wish I could do it all the time uh, and we do do it here we do make scones but as I say about the cream clotted cream is just not the same so that's something that I really really miss and uh, I've actually tried to get uh, clotted cream back from the UK to Sweden a number of times in my hand luggage um, it hasn't always gone according to plan so um, maybe that's a story for another day but talking about moving things from the UK to Sweden is quite a nice segue to my story time for today today we're going to be talking about the journey and the adventures and the trials and tribulations of me moving from the UK to Sweden which as I said I've done about two years ago that's when I made the move um, and obviously moved my life out here the plan was to be here permanently so I needed to move a grand majority of my things I obviously had to switch jobs but the story that I want to tell you today is about the reality of trying to move my possessions, which you would think would be quite easy, moving just from the UK to Sweden. It's one of our closest neighbours. It really shouldn't be that difficult. Even before the pandemic, it was a nightmare. Where do I even begin with this story? So I made the decision that I was going to be moving to Sweden. I had uh, secured my job. I'd sorted out somewhere to live. I'd got all of my residency sorted. I felt like I was in quite a good position and I'd agreed the date for my start date at my new job. So I knew when I needed to be in Sweden. Then we set about thinking, how do I get all of the things in my family home where I've been living before uh, and transport them across to Sweden? And of course, the obvious thing to do would be to take a truck or book some sort of a trailer and just get somebody to transport it across in, you know, like a DPD or UPS style delivery service. But there were certain things that they would not take. For example, I have a iMac, you know, one of the desktop Macs um, that is really important to me and I wanted to have with me and that has a huge glass screen. And most of these delivery companies refuse to take iMacs because they're worried about breaking them and because they can't control its safety during the delivery. And even with insurance, they wouldn't cover it. So this was kind of one of the main cruxes of my issues and lots of people around me at the time were probably tearing their hair out saying, can you just leave the iMac behind? This is making our lives difficult. But so as soon as it became clear that we couldn't take it on a truck and no delivery service would take it, the next dilemma became, well, how else can we get it to Sweden? There must be like a ferry service or some sort of transit ferry, right? There used to be, but there's not anymore. We could get it to Amsterdam, we could get it to France, we could get it to Belgium, but then we would have to transport it the rest of the way ourselves, which still meant driving from England all the way across to Amsterdam or something and then round to Sweden. At one point, we did even look at just taking our own car and driving from England to Sweden, which would probably take about 23, 24 hours and have to be done across two days. It's just getting too expensive for something that really didn't need to be that difficult. So then I had a bit of a brainwave bear with me, this gets a bit crazy now, because we had my bed that needed to come with me because it was actually cheaper to take my bed than it was to build uh, to buy a new one. We had lots of possessions that I wanted to bring with me, my personal effects, my clothes and things like that. That could all be transported by itself in a truck. So we booked all of that and my bed, which we had to take apart into pieces, and booked it in a truck and it was it traveled it left a few weeks before me and traveled all the way to sweden to arrive when i was there but then we still had the problem with the imac so the idea that i reached was why don't we just take it on the plane with us and i looked at could i book it into uh, the hold luggage but the airline who i was flying with ryanair of course aren't known for being uh, the most giving and the most uh, open of people. Uh, in fact, they were quite stingy uh, and that was not going to be an option either because there's a bit of a drop when uh, they take the conveyor belt with all of the stuff from uh, the terminal into the plane. And again, they would not guarantee, they would not take it that way either because they were also concerned about the fact that they would break it. So then the option became, maybe I just need to take it on the plane with me. This is absolutely mental. But um, we had to book a separate seat on the plane for my iMac label it Mr. I, surname Mac, 
Um, and then we had to take it on the plane. I didn't even know this was a service that existed, but there are, you know, some exceptions with like certain uh, instruments, for example, or even a wedding dress or something that they listed where it's just not appropriate to put it in the hold. They can't guarantee its safety. So the other option, so that you don't obviously have to break the item or fold it if it was the dress or whatever, is you can book a seat for it. And there are only very specific items that they will allow you to do this with. One of them that they won't allow you to do this with is a computer. Um, but I just had to take the gamble at the end of the day. So me and my dad go to the airport, I'm back under arm. Uh, we've had to ring the airport in advance to see if it's gonna be small enough to fit into the conveyor belt through security, because if it's not, they won't take it and it will have to stay in England and I'll have to, uh, I'll have to fly off without it. Fortunately, it just about fits. We get it through the conveyor belt. Um, we carry it through the airport. We carry it to the terminal uh, the whole time panic stations, is it gonna be let on the plane? It was obviously wrapped up in a box. Uh, fortunately, nobody even questioned what it was, which is alarm bells ringing by this point. Seems a bit weird. Should that be the way it works on the plane? On this occasion, I didn't mind because it suited me. Any other occasion, I'd be worried about our safety and security in that plane. But anyway, they let me take it on board. There we are, carrying this huge iMac, taking it on the plane, it sits next to us on the plane, it has to be strapped into a seatbelt. It's there for the duration of the flight. And that is how I got my iMac from the UK to Sweden. First world problems, I know. And then the, the drama didn't stop them because at the other end, we picked up a hire car. You know, we moved me in with my iMac and the other bits and pieces that I'd taken um, myself uh, on the plane, my clothes and things like that. And then the truck with my bed and my other bigger personal effects was due to arrive and it got delayed. Now, it's kind of obvious that you need a bed. You need somewhere to sleep. And in the room that I was hiring in this like shared house, um, there was nothing. There was like a built-in wardrobe, nothing else. I was gonna have to sleep on the floor with no bedding, no pillows, no quilt, no nothing. That was all on the truck. But then we realized that actually, although the truck was supposed to be here on, I think it was supposed to be here on the Monday, but my dad and I were here until the Thursday, which was the day I had to start work. So we had a few days leeway. Um, and every day we kept thinking, maybe today it's gonna come, maybe today, no sign. So on the Wednesday afternoon, I managed to track down a phone number for the Swedish department uh, of this particular delivery company. And they tell me that uh, they they look up the item and they can see that it's in a town that is about 30 minutes away from me, but will not be delivered until the next day. By which point it's too late because I'm going to work and I'm gonna be stuck without, I won't be there to even let it in. So it will get taken back to the depot and then it's gonna cost a lot of time and money to get that sorted. So we decided to drive to pick it up. So we drive out, no idea if we can even fit all of this stuff inside the car. You know, a huge bed board, all of the like wooden panels that go in the bed, the frame and everything else. Uh, we have no idea if the hire car that we have picked is gonna be big enough for this because we didn't expect this to be a problem. We didn't expect to need to do this. Um, but we drive out, we find the depot, we find someone who lets us in and they're surprised because it's not usually the way that you pick up your items. Uh, but they agree to help us, pull out the van that has all of my things in, and they load, we load all the stuff out, put it into our car, drive off, and then we realise about halfway back, and I have to give all the credit to my dad here, shout out to him, because I didn't notice, uh, but the wooden slots or like panels that go in between the bed frame, two by two all the way down the bed, um, we don't remember seeing them going in the car. So did they get lost on the way? Or are they in the car and we just missed them? Without those, you can't build the bed. You can build the frame, but the, the actual mattress isn't gonna sit anywhere because there's no effort for it to be supported. And then we realize that we remember the driver of the van throwing these wooden planks into the skip, into the bin back at the depot uh, while we were there. And we didn't really think anything of it. We thought it was obviously, you know, something from a previous shipment or previous delivery, just rubbish they found in the van. But then my dad says, well, maybe we should go drive back and check. And I'm so glad that he did because when we got back there, those were my wooden panels. And not only were they in the bin, but they were about to be taken off for disposal. So you can imagine the frustration. It was fever pitch. And I was so grateful to my dad that he uh, remembered to think about us going to pick that up because I had totally forgotten and I would have had a bed frame and nothing to be able to sleep on still. But eventually after all of that, we got it all assembled. We went back home. Somehow it all worked out. Lots of coincidences that all fell into place just in the right way. And now here I am, uh, and I've actually moved since then, and I'll be talking a little bit more about that again in another episode. But that is the story of my dramatic move to Sweden and how my iMac became a person with its own seat on a plane. Anyway, that is it for today's episode of Just A Bit Abroad. Thank you for tuning in for the second episode. As I say, I really want you engaged in this show, so if you have any ideas, 
or you know things that you'd like me to do, tags you'd like me to do, stories you'd like me to tell, let me know in the comments below or hit me up on social media and share those with me and I will be sure to try and incorporate those into the episode. And as I say over time, I'd also like to have some of you guys involved interacting as guests or things as well. So if you would like to be involved, just, just reach out to me and let me know. But that is it for today. Thank you for checking out another episode of Just a Brit Board. Make sure you are subscribed and you turn the bell on so that you get notified when the new episode comes out in a couple of weeks time. That is it for today. Thank you for your attention and for just joining me and I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Catch you soon, guys. Bye-bye.